Well, I have been asked to speak about Anglicanism from a missionary and global perspective. So uh, let's launch into this thing. And I see that we have a clock in the back, which is very good, because then I can, I can keep focused on that. The Anglican uh, Communion has had a glorious history of mission. Uh, but to understand that, I think we have to walk back in history a bit uh, to what's known as the Ecclesia Anglicana. But before even we get there, I want to quickly, and I could spend the whole session on this, but I want to quickly talk about Four um, wings of, of the Anglican world, if you will. Uh, because if you're going to understand Anglicanism, you need to understand that, that you'll find people in each of these wings, even in a um, broadly orthodox way of understanding Anglicanism. And so let's begin with one you heard about the first two weeks. That is the evangelical wing of Anglicanism. Um, I think you heard a lecture on that last week, is that right? And you heard a lecture on that the first week uh, it, when you were rooted in the Reformation. Uh, just quickly, the evangelical wing of Anglicanism emphasizes the transcendence of God, that he is above all, beyond all, outside of all that he has made. He, his spirit may penetrate through the, the creation, but God stands over and above the created order of the world. His presence when the human being encounters it, or even when the earth encounters it, responds with awe and wonder because he is totally other, wholly other than us. God is not a man, as the Bible says, that he should repent. And evangelicalism emphasizes that God has revealed himself in Holy Scripture. They would, uh, evangelicals will, uh, would also say he has revealed himself in the created order in what they call general revelation. But, and we can learn certain things about God through wandering in, uh, in the natural world. But as C.S. Lewis put it in one of his writings, sooner or later you've got to come in from the out of doors and the wonder of God's created order and sit down with the book through which we get his revelation today. He has revealed himself quintessentially in Jesus Christ. One hymn that would grow out of the evangelical wing of the church would be Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. Fear what? Fear God. And grace, my fear relieved. Why did it relieve me? Because it put me into right relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Those of you who attend the, the, uh, the is it the nine o'clock service, the contemporary worship service? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my what? Something, my raw. You, you're in that group. What? It, Okay. He took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe. Then on the cross, uh, he, uh, uh, he bore God's wrath. How does that go? Something to that effect, right? Was satisfied. That's an evangelical doctrine that the cross not only reveals God's love for the human race, but God's, the cross... Is, is God's answer to the estrangement between human beings and God and the estrangement between God and human beings. And on our side, it is us running away from God and our sin has put a wall or a barrier between us. And on God's side, uh, the holy God cannot look upon the unholiness of man without some sacrifice 
The wrath of God was satisfied. Not every wing of the church would, would want to embrace that. But evangelical understanding sees that rooted in scripture. And it emphasizes the gospel. That there is a fracture that runs through every human being. It runs through our minds so we do not think rightly. It runs through our hearts or emotions so we do not feel rightly. It runs through our bodily appetites so we don't desire rightly. That is our human condition. That is the result of the fall. God, in order to deal with the fall of the human race, sent His Son to, to bridge that gap between us. And that is the good news that, that has come through Jesus Christ. The evangelicals often emphasizes doctrine and the dogma of the church. There is true doctrine that needs to be understood and learned and would emphasize that. Okay? Now, you heard a lot about that last week. Is that right? And the week before? Are you tracking with me there? Okay. Let's go down here to another wing. And we're going to call this the holiness. The holiness wing of the church. And the emphasis here is on God's eminence. His presence with us through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And the emphasis here is upon... Yes, this will emphasize... Uh, the, the need to be born again, to be regenerated, to be re for spiritual rebirth. But this will emphasize the importance of you and me having a personal experience of God. And uh, a personal experience of the Holy Spirit. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. You might sing that from time to time at the, at the traditional service. I don't know if you sing that song, um, You Are the Air I Breathe. Do you know that one? Uh, okay. Um, I'm desperate without you sort of thing. Almost sounds like a love song. That makes me, a, as an Anglican evangelical, a little nervous. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if we've crossed over the line and I'm hearing a love song that's been adapted to uh, the Christianity and so it makes me just a little uneasy. But then I see the people kind of worshiping God and I say, take a step back, Mark. And, you know, different strokes for different folks. And I, I, I'm going to take refuge here. But, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not afraid of that personal experience. And so, uh, it, that's not one of my favorite worship songs, but, but I, it is for other people. You are the air I breathe. Okay. Well, He is, through the Holy Spirit, closer than the breath we breathe. He abides in us. He is in all, through all, sustaining all that He has made. Mystics uh, focus on the, the, the fact that we can... We can walk into this holy presence of God. The charismatic movement of the 70s and 80s, you would fit that in here. Doesn't mean that some of them weren't evangelical. Some of the charismatics of the 70s and 80s were evangelical, but some of them weren't. And they didn't have an evangelical theology and a more Catholic theology. We'll get to that. The renewal movements of Crucio. Any of you go to the Crucio? Okay, touchy, feely. Um, I want to feel God's love. I've never felt such love. You know, your people stand up and well, at Crisio, and they always talk about uh, the uh, the love, the love. <laughs> they don't uh, they don't stand up and say, "I love doctrine, I love dogma, and I love these teachings of the Christian faith." It's just I never felt so much love. You see, and the emphasis is on feeling and my experience of God, which causes the uh, the people that aren't really into fuzzies to stand back and say, well, I don't know if I want to go to that weekend or not. <laughs> okay, you get, you get the difference between these two so far, even though they're very much on the same page in terms of a personal relationship with a personal Savior. Now, there's another dimension, and we'll call that the Catholic dimension of Anglicanism. 
This emphasizes the importance of the church. These people may talk about the church and they may talk about the church, but it's not nearly... These people want to emphasize the importance of Scripture. This want experience of Jesus. Here now we're, we're talking about the church. The importance of the church. We'll come back to this and you'll see why I'm emphasizing some of these things a, a little later. Hopefully if we get to what I really want to talk about. They, they see the church as an organic institution. The church is an institution. Uh, a, a spiritual institution but a visible institution. And it's organic. And the emphasis here is upon the sacraments. And a sacramental worldview of, of, of all of life. Litur liturgy, ritual, ceremony are primary. The evangelical can sit kind of loose to that. The, the holiness people... Well, if it facilitates that personal experience of God, then, then they're all for that. But for many of the Catholics, the liturgy in and of itself is the experience. They would emphasize the need for ascetical practices, all those Lenten disciplines that people talk about. You know, uh, fasting, uh, meditation, um, Acts of almsgiving, um, religious observances of various kinds. They would emphasize the Catholic order of uh, bishops, priests, and deacons, and the importance of that threefold order of ministry is, is very fundamental. In fact, some of them would say without the bishop, there's no church. See, an Anglican evangelical would say this. Anglican Evangelical would say the bishop is for the good of the church but not necessary for the church and sometimes unfortunately a hindrance to the church. <laughs> but a godly bishop like J.C. Ryle for instance well now he's good for the church because he's emphasizing the doctrine of the church and the Bible and bring, reminding us of the importance of these things. But these people would say the, the, the bishop is of the essence of the church. You can't have the church without the bishop. And where the bishop is, there the church is, you see. And so, uh, in that case, then the diocese becomes more important than the local church. An evangelical would be hard-pressed to want to say that. And this person may want to say that, 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 that me and Jesus have our own thing going, and if the church helps that, Okay. And if it doesn't, then somebody needs to get out of the way and it ain't me and Jesus. Okay. Now I'm emphasizing things extremely here. When, when this became emphasized in Anglicanism in the 19th century, the emphasis was, was to get back to the to medieval understandings of liturgy and, bring, and it brought in candles and vestments and gothic church buildings and stained glass windows. All of that was downplayed before that. See? So many of the things that you, we take for granted in the church today, you wouldn't have had at the time, shortly after the Reformation and on into the 18th century until the Catholic movement of the 19th century. Uh, Ian went to one of the seminary that focused on that. Um, we'll come back to that too. And then over here we have the liberal, not Ian, but I mean, <laughs> the li uh, and this emphasizes the place of reason in the life of the church. If here we have the spirit, if over here we have uh, uh, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and the scriptures. And over here we have the importance of the church. Not that they exclude the others. I'm talking about an emphasis here. Over here we have the, the importance of reason. And the need to engage with thought forms and ideas of the world around us. Uh, we're not going to go over into a little monastery and emphasize the monastic way of life. That, that is sometimes frustrating to the more evangelical student 
like Hunter Jordan, who's up at, at, at um, Neshota House. Because there's this cycle of prayer every day, and you're in church in the morning, evening, nighty night, night sort of thing. And pretty soon you want to say, Where, how are we going to engage the world for the gospel? How are we going to interact with ideas of the world if we're spending all our time in, this, in these ritualistic uh, worship services? All So there's an engagement with thought forms and ideas of the present. Engagement with the social structure and movements of the day. How many of you like to read C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis is an apologist. But you notice something about it. His apology, his, uh, his arguments for the Christian faith usually don't begin with the Bible. They begin with Christian thinking. He reasons with people. He starts in a place of reason and argues them into a Christian understanding, a Christian worldview. Isn't that what he does? That's why you give it to your atheist or your agnostic friends because make them grapple with the intellectual truth of Christianity. They're too, they're, they're too quick to dismiss the Bible. But if you can meet them on their own ground and take every thought captive, captive for Christ, then you can engage them. Um, th there's a key place here for general revelation. What God has revealed uh, uh, of who he is. So, so now I'm not using this as revisionism. Those of you who, who are follows uh, the, uh, the challenge that we've had in the Episcopal Church in the last 40 years. We're not dealing with, with a true liberalism there. We're dealing with an ideology. An ideologically driven position. Which seeks to revise the Christian faith. Not to have a more liberal understanding of where we begin in our conversations with people. Does this make sense to you? And, and you see, all four of these, in a good Anglicanism, live in some kind of tension with one another. And I, for one, wouldn't want to lose any of them, actually. Now, there's, there's going to be one wing I'm going to want to spend most of my life in. But I would not want to live in that world to the exclusion. I would not want to live in... The, I'm, I'm what you call an Anglican evangelical. But I would not want to remove that need for Crisio to touch somebody's life in a new way. I would not want to deny the, the, the spiritual gifts functioning in the body of Christ. I would not want to deny the place of reason in engaging the culture around us. Does this make sense? We have in the Bible what's known as the quadrilateral, in the Bible, in the prayer book, what's known as the quadrilateral. You ever heard of the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral? The quadrilateral says, look, there are four things that, that we take as essential for our Anglicans. One is the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain everything necessary for salvation. The sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion or Holy Eucharist administered with the words that Jesus used to administer them as essential for the Christian life. The creeds of the Apostles' Creed and uh, the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed as sufficient statements of the Christian faith. We say the creed in every service we have. Every, whether it be a morning <coughs> prayer service or a baptismal service or a confirmation service or Holy Eucharist. Write one or write two. The creed is there. Either the Apostles' Creed in morning prayer or the Nicene Creed, Eucharist, as a sufficient statement of faith. It is, if you will, the eyeglasses through which we read the Scriptures. If you're reading the Scriptures and you come up with a doctrine different than what's there in the creeds, step back and rethink your position. You may have stepped away from a right understanding 
of what God has revealed of himself. And then the historic episcopacy uh, locally adapted. The historic episcopacy, what's that? Well, a bishop in succession with bishops back through the century. Okay. So, that's what you call uh, kind of uh, broadly speaking, not broad Anglicanism, but broadly speaking, uh, an Anglican understanding. So when I say uh, we are called by God to make biblical Anglicans for a global age, most places in the world, I wouldn't have to add biblical. <laughs> but because we've been in North American Anglicanism where an extreme form of this has dominated the church for far too long, we have to add. I, I, I needed when I first articulated that back in 2009 to put the word biblical in front of Anglican because there were those who would want to denigrate the scriptures and what God has revealed. Okay, now, having said that, how does Anglicanism go about doing the task of mission? And what's a global perspective on it? Well, that's where we have to go back to what I said at the beginning. Ecclesia Anglicana. You say, okay, Bishop, what's that? Well, Christianity, as best as we know it, came to the British Isles in the second century at the latest. And it most likely came there through Roman soldiers and merchants. And where uh, the, um, the Roman Empire spread from the south of what we think of as England, not Scotland, uh, not Ireland or Scotland, but all the way up to Hadrian's Wall, Rome established Roman culture and sought to Romanize the Britons. There were no English there at that time. The people who lived there, best to call them Britons. They were Celtic, but unlike the Celts in Ireland, they came under the sway of Rome. And they were civilized according to Roman values of civilization. And when Christianity seeped in, if you will, because it didn't go there by some, as far as we know, some mission sent by someone. It just came in with Roman soldiers and merchants doing their stuff. And it began to take root 3rd century, 4th century. But round about the 5th century, when the Germanic tribes began to uh, invade what we think of as much of southern Europe and put pressure on Rome, Rome decided it couldn't hold everything that it had out there. So what's the first place you step away from? That island up there off the coast of what we think of as France. So. Rome pulled out of Britain. When Rome pulled out of Britain, nature abhors a vacuum. And the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes began to evade Germanic hordes. Germanic barbarians <laughs> began to invade what we think of today as England. The Anglo-Saxons began to drive those Romanized Christians who were in Britain at the time, drove them up into the hills of Wales. Rather than trying to convert the barbarians, they retreated into the hills of Wales and complained about them. 
warred against them and resented them and, and just became little enclaves. No missionary spirit. In fact, one of their own writings said these people have no passion to reach the lost, to reach these dramatic hordes. Okay, now, so there they are, a little huddled group. Up in the, in the Welsh hills. And coming over from Ireland were some wild Irish Celts who would raid these little Christian communities there. And on one raid, they took someone named Patrick back with them. Patrick was a 16-year-old boy whose grandfather was a priest and father was a deacon. And he sat lightly towards his faith. He sat lightly towards his faith until he's now in captivity. And he began to pray and to reconnect with his God and with his Lord. And he began to have dreams. And, and one dream... He was, he was given directions of how to get back to his homeland. And he followed the directions and got on a boat carrying a bunch of Irish wolfhounds. And there's debate whether they were going to England or to the Europe. But he got on that boat and got off of, of, away from Ireland. And he replugged back into his Christian life among people. But he had another dream. And in the dream, he had an Irishman saying, Come back among us, holy boy, and share the gospel with us. So, I, uh, so Patrick, who's not Irish at all, right? But uh, a British Christian living in the hills of Wales went back to Ireland and Irish culture unlike Roman culture is not organized around cities. It's organized around tribes and tribes have uh, uh, tribal chieftains. So Patrick said we're going to adapt I don't know if he said it like this but I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to say it like this. We're going to adapt what we need to do to reach these people to the culture of where we are. So, so a, a whole understanding of what we think of as Celtic Christianity began to emerge. And what emerged was the one who stayed, and he set up little monastic communities that were organized around abbots. But those monastic communities were set up in such a way that they would send out bishops and clergy out into the surrounding areas to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And so, these little monastic communities began to be set up all over uh, the place. And those who were called... To go out and reach these barbarian groups, where, tribes, wherever they may be. Whether they be in, in, in Ireland or Scotland or North England. They saw it as a kind of martyrdom. Listen to this one prayer by one of them. Shall I abandon, O king of mysteries, the soft comforts of home? Shall I turn my back on my native land and turn my face towards the sea? Shall I put myself wholly at your mercy without silver, without a horse, without fame, without honor? Shall I throw myself wholly upon you without sword and shield, without food and drink, without a bed to lie on? Shall I say farewell to my beautiful land, placing myself under your yoke? Shall I pour out of my heart, my heart to you, confessing my manifold sins and begging forgiveness, tears streaming down my cheeks? Shall I leave the prints of my knees on the sandy beach, a record of my final prayer in my native land? 
Shall I then suffer every kind of wound that the sea can inflict? Shall I take my tiny boat across the wide, sparkling ocean? O King of the glorious heaven, shall I go of my own choice upon the sea, O Christ? O Christ, will you help me on the wild waves? And they'd get in a little coracle, tiny little boat, and hanging from their waistband, if you will, the, the girdle around their robe, was a book of the Holy Gospels. It was the same place where the Celtic warriors used to keep the shriveled heads of their victims. But now, instead of the shriveled heads of their victims whom they had cut their heads off, now they're Christianized, and there in that place is a copy of the gospel. And they get in the boat, and wherever the sea takes them, that's where the gospel of Jesus Christ will be preached when they get there. They saw it as a kind of white martyrdom. Wherever you go, Lord, take me, I'm off. So they would kneel there on the sand and get in then and say their prayer, and off they'd go. But they had a passion to share the gospel with people. So some ended up in Scotland. Some ended up in what we think of as Northumbria, Northern England. And everywhere they went, they began to evangelize and set up monastic communities where they preserved uh, knowledge, uh, education, literature, the classics. Some of you may have read the book, How Are the Irish Saved Civilization? Well, that's how they saved it, because it was being lost every place else. So they eventually, oh, why don't I put this? This is England. Here's Ireland, Scotland up here. They, began, they, they set a monastery here called Iona, and from there they began to evangelize what we think of as northern England and Northumbria. This was around the late 500s and early 600s to evangelize the Anglo-Saxons. Okay? Meanwhile, back at Rome, a pope comes to the throne named Gregory. We think of him today as Gregory the Great. The story goes that he's wandering one day through the Roman markets and he sees a slave on sale who's tall and blonde and fair-skinned. And he asks, who is this? Where does he come from? From Angleland, they say. And he says, Angle? He looks like an angel to me. And he had a desire to evangelize these people. So in 596, he gets a fellow by the, out of a monastery there in Rome named Augustine and sends Augustine up to uh, evangelize the Angles. They get... Uh, Augustine and his 40 monks stay in a place somewhere in what we think of as France and they begin hearing stories of the Anglo-Saxon barbarians. And they decide they're going to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't going there! But they made the mistake of writing back to Gregory and Gregory says to them, better not to begin a project than to stop in the middle of it. Get up there and get it done. <laughs> so they arrive in 597 in what we think of as Canterbury today. And lo and behold, he discovers that the king, Ethelbert, is married to a woman named Bertha who just happens to be a Christian. Well, that gives him a little bit of peace. He begins to preach the gospel. Miracles are manifested and Ethelbert and his whole kingdom is converted. So the gospel starts moving up this way. Meanwhile, 
up in the north, I've got to move past because I'm way behind already. <laughs> you can say, what does this have to do with Angl <laughs> the spread of the Anglican communion? Well, uh, I hope I'll, I'll get to the place where I can tie it together. <laughs> Well, I don't have time to go into Edwin's. Let's forget it. <laughs> a brand of Celtic Christianity is taking over this part. A Romanized Christianity is taking over the southern part. They meet in a place called Whitby in 664 to decide which are they going to go with. Right? Which, which, calendar, which, which calendar, which haircut, um... Which robes, um, you know, what style of worship music? <laughs> and they say, hey, you know, that, um, that holiness stuff ain't going to get it done. That feely stuff of, of just getting in a boat and letting the Spirit take you wherever the Spirit's going to take you. That's just a little bit out there a ways. We need more organization. We need more centralization. We need more Catholic understanding of the church okay but it doesn't so what emerges then is Anglo-Saxon Christianity which combines some of this Celtic stuff and some of this Roman stuff and they start sending people out to evangelize Germany and other places. So, right there in, in the, uh, I should say this too. When the Viking hordes up in Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden begin to do their romps, one of the first places they decide to arrive is in places like Ireland and Northern England. Easy pickings. So I'm th now this is the uh, late 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. But unlike the British Christians who just got angry towards the Anglo-Saxon, the Germanic tribes that then invaded them, these Anglo-Saxons decide to share the gospel with these people who are taking over. And to give you an example of how thoroughly they ended up converting them, do you know the English a word for the cross? You know what the, the, the old uh, Anglo-Saxon word for cross is? Anybody? It's rude. R-O-O-D. You know where the word cross comes from? It is the Viking word for cross. That just gives you an idea in, in just one little word nutshell of how thoroughly the Anglo-Saxon Christians decided to evangelize the invaders. I wonder if English Christians today have the courage to evangelize the Muslim who are arriving in England. Will they be like the Brits? Or will they be like the Anglo-Saxons? I wonder. History may, may depend upon it. In fact, I would say all over Europe Western civilization may depend upon it. But let's move on. This brings us up to about 1066. <laughs> We're moving really quickly. <laughs> 1066, the Normans invade England and there's the Norman conquest. Anglo-Saxon Christianity goes underground. And Norman Latin Christianity begins to take over. If one can say Celtic Christianity in England lasted 400 years, Anglo-Saxon Christianity lasted 400 years. Norman Latin Christianity lasts about 400 years till the roots of the Reformation begin taking place. 
And you heard about the Reformation from Rob Sturdy. Is that right? Did he tell you this about the Reformation? That the Reformers by and large did not have a passion to evangelize the world? Did he tell you that they were mostly stuck in a dispensational understanding of the gospel and did not go out to try to evangelize and do missions among the pagans of the world? It is a sad aspect of the Reformation theology that they didn't do that. While Reformed thinkers were basically content with setting up a Christian state, they were not like the Roman Catholics who sent out people like Francis Xavier to evangelize China and Japan and they didn't send people over to South America or to North America to evangelize anybody. They got their doctrine right, I think. They got their theology right, mostly. But the mission, passion, to evangelize the world had to wait. So, by the time of the Church of England's uh, spiritual apex, if you will, under the likes of Elizabeth and James I, um, what we have is a Christianized culture and a Christian way of worshiping with the Book of Common Prayer and a deepened understanding of the Scriptures. How do we go from the Church of England in the 1600s and 1700s and the 1800s located primarily in one place on one island off the north and coast of Europe to Anglicanism all around the world with 80 million people. From every, as Ian said at the beginning, from every tribe, language, people, and nation. How do we get there? What happens? Well, three ways. One, coincidental. <laughs> what do we mean by coincidental? Well, colonies began to be a spread in North America, i.e. what we think of as South Carolina, Virginia, um, Maryland, everywhere the English went, guess what went with them? The Church of England, right? But they didn't go there to evangelize the people who were there. They went there to set up colonies for, uh, for the mother country. They did the same in Australia. So, um, and I have to say this about the Christianity they brought. It wasn't very passionate. It was rooted in an enlightenment deistic worldview for the most part. You know what I mean by that? God set the world up like a big clock. He got it running and he stood back and watched it run. And it was guided by principles that he had written into the world. But he didn't mess around with it. And do miracles today. And intrude into it. But in the late 18th century. Some people by the name of John Wesley. And Charles Wesley. And George Whitfield. Began to reconnect with their evangelical heritage. That is there in England in the Church of England, and they began to reconnect with that holiness movement that is there, carried on by people like the Puritans and others. And in reconnecting with them, they experienced the power of the gospel to change their lives. And they began to preach that power of God to change lives. And when that began to happen, guess what? People in the colonies began to come to the conclusion we need to evangelize these people around us. And they began to do so. 
But they also began to establish missionary communities. So in this evangelical awakening of the 18th and early 19th century, and I have to go quickly here, uh, things like uh, the church uh, missionary society began to emerge. The church missionary society was a group of Anglicans, people in the Church of England, who were passionate about sharing their faith with, in Jesus Christ with the lost. It did not come down from Mother Church did not come down from the Archbishop of Canterbury. It did not come down from the bishops. It came down from local priests like these two men and local lay people like you here in this uh, uh, church tonight who began to have a desire to reach the lost. And they set up societies in order to go about doing that and they began to send people out. Some went to Africa. Some went to India. Some went to uh, New Zealand. They just went all over the world. And began to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was in the ni early 19th centuries. Then a little later. That Catholic movement that I talked about. This was in the uh, mid to late 19th century. These people began to have a passion for those people who were no longer going to church in the big industrialized cities of England and America. And they began to send priests into areas where no one wanted to go and to live in slum communities and to reach the lost. And others were, felt like they ought to go to places like Wisconsin. <laughs> Which in the 19th century was pretty bleak and cold and barren. <laughs> and even now some would say it's bleak and cold and barren. <laughs> and they went to places no one wanted to go. Why did they go there? Because no one wanted them. And with them they brought a more Catholic understanding of the church. Okay, anyway, I'm going to pause right now and uh, see if you have questions for this very uh, quick thumbnail sketch that I did uh, about how the Anglican world has gone about doing mission. But one of the things I, I hope uh, I can make a connection with is that if you trace this long history back, some of these people who went about doing mission and evangelizing the world did it from that holiness perspective that I talked about. Some of them did it from that evangelical perspective that I talked about. Some of them did it from that Catholic perspective. And some of them have done it from that more liberal perspective that we talked about. Uh, but in each case, there was enough of the other in the Anglican worldview <laughs> that we can say there was a balance. One of the things I, I'm saddened by, I have to say it this way I suppose, I'm saddened by the fact that the Episcopal Church in our day wasn't able to keep that balance between those four poles or wings of Anglicanism. And because of that, not only did it lose the gospel, it hasn't been able to win North America for Jesus Christ. But if you go to Nigeria, you'll see that Anglicans are the strongest church in the country. You go to Kenya, and Anglicans are one of the strongest churches in the country. You go to Uganda, and Anglicans are one of the strongest churches in the country. It's been able to maintain that balance between those four poles of Christianity, if you will, of wings of Anglicanism. And I think it's important for us in our day 
not to lose them either. I'm going to pause there. I think it is a, it is a, a form of Christianity that can win the culture of today if we just don't lose it. I'm going to pause there. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Thumbnail 